Hello and welcome to Hot Culture. I'm Callum Erskine. And I'm Nikki Scott. This is our online show where we bring you the hottest cultural issues of today. Coming up on today's programme. Rosie Baker is in Canterbury to find out how an Enid Blyton exhibit is causing a stir. So Megan Perfect discovers how a Kent art society is attempting to bring in new, younger members. Um, so... And Nina Goodall brings the first instalment of our two-part debate on graffiti. The Beanie Gallery in Canterbury has unveiled a new exhibition based on the life and works of Enid Blyton. But to many, the books of the childhood icon contain themes not suitable in modern times. Rosie Baker investigates whether Enid's works still have a place in today's society. Mystery Magic and Midnight Feasts, The Many Adventures of Enid Blyton displays lifestyle models of the author's most famous books such as Noddy and Blyton's original hand-corrected typescripts. Martin Crowther, Museum and Galleries Manager at Canterbury City Council, believes the exhibition will bring families and their children together, remembering Blyton's greats. I think Enid Blyton is you know, still very much loved um, by people in this country across the generations. Blyton's work became increasingly controversial between literary critics, parents and teachers in the 1950s and onwards. This was because of her alleged unchallenging nature between her writing and the themes of her books. Although the exhibit may bring conflict between critics, Martin thinks there is elements of Blyton's work that should be celebrated. Yeah, I mean, I mean she was very much a product of her, her time. I mean, if you look at it from today's society, yeah, I mean, certainly some of her characters in her stories would, would not feature today and, and that's absolutely right and proper but um, I think we've got to look at her in, in context and she did write some wonderful stories and if you just keep that element out of it uh, I think there's lots there to, to enjoy. The famous author's work has been called racist, sexist and elitist. Charlie Byrne who works in a bookshop disagrees with her original transcripts being on show. Racism was standard procedure of, of the British people at the time and I believe in modern society, we shouldn't be teaching old-fashioned views on things like this for children. And I think we can update them, bring them into the 21st century, get the classics that we love, but suitable for the modern day. However, local author Faye Beerling disagrees and thinks it's a nice idea to share with children traditional books about having adventures. I think it's lovely that she is still being celebrated, you know, as an amazing authoress, if you like, all those years ago until now. The exhibit will go on until April 19th, displaying Blyton's stories and bringing them to life for all generations. And now, Charlie Byrne, a bookshop worker from Hythe, is joining us in the studio. He believes that Enid Blyton's works just need updating. He's talking to Rosie Baker upstairs. Hi, I'm joined here with Charlie. So, do you think Enid Blyton's exhibition is relevant today, even though her work has been called racist? Yeah, I do think it's, it's very relevant today. I think Enid Blyton's a very important part of our literary history, and uh, although her work may be considered racist, it reflects a time where our country had very different views on, on such matters, and I think it's important for children to be able to understand where we came from and still accept that that was a big part of our culture then, and parts of it are still relevant today, although some may not be. Um, do you think that Blyton's original transcript should be hidden away from children, even though they should know the difference between right and wrong? No, not at all. I think, I think if children are very young, then obviously then we should be showing them work that encourages good morals and learning positive ways to live their life. But I think it's important that we don't treat children as stupid. They can make their own decisions and they need to, they need to learn about the way that the world's changed and is still changing. Otherwise, we have nowhere to go in the future, so they should see where we've come from. And where we've got to go. And do you think there's been too much focus on um, Brighton's original transcripts in the exhibition? Yes, I do, I do think so. I think we should focus more on how we can take this classic literary stories and the way that they've been developed for a modern audience and show to children how that you can take something that might not necessarily work in the modern day and how you can adapt it and then that gives these children a chance to learn and develop as well. Okay, thank you. That was really interesting to hear your point of view on it. Okay. Back to the studio. Thanks very much, Rosie. Next up, Canterbury Society of Art meets weekly in Bleen and already has over 100 members on its books. Now, they're attempting to update their image in order to bring in a younger crowd. Megan Perfect went to one of these meetings to find out more. The Canterbury Society of Art meets here at Bleen Village Hall every Monday to participate in all things arty. 
They can take part in anything from cutting mount board to drawing live models. In recent months, the society have decided that they want to appeal to a fresher, more youthful demographic. Wendy Childs is the secretary for the entire group and she explains what they are looking for in their newer members. We try to cater for every sort of artist, um, the professional ones and the amateurs. And, we, and that's our aim actually, it's not, we're not elitists, we do, you don't have to be good at art to be a member, you just have to want to do it really. The group already has over 100 members, but they have decided that they want to reach out in an attempt to attract a new and younger crowd. Andrew McNally is the treasurer and webmaster for the society, and he discusses how they plan on drawing in the youth of today. As a society, we need more younger members. We've had uh, a few in the last year, but uh, we find now that if we want to increase our membership, the younger members, we've got to embrace social media. It is estimated that over 70% of all internet users are in some form of social networking site, with the majority being 18 to 29 year olds. This means that there is massive potential for the society to bring awareness to the younger generation. The society would be one of the million other small to medium sized businesses that already use social media as a marketing platform. But just how effective will social networks be in the society's bid to gain a new following with the next generation? Megan Perfect reporting for Hot Culture here in Blean, Canterbury. Andrew McNally is treasurer of the society. He's joined us in the studio today to discuss on how they plan on using their online presence to attract a younger crowd. Over to you, Megan. Hi, Callum. I'm joined by Andrew McNally from the Society Now. So, how many members do you currently have in the club and how many of these are young people? We have just over 100 um, and not many young ones. Um, we've had uh, a couple of new younger members join in the last year, but that's about it. Okay, and why do you feel it is important for the society to appeal to a younger audience? Well, we are a rather silver-haired bunch, mainly, and uh, um, old, the older members die off, you know, and uh, the society will shrink and disappear eventually if we don't recruit uh, younger people. So how are you planning on raising awareness to draw in the younger generation, and how much progress have you made on this so far? I don't know. Well, we've... Um, uh, Last year, year before last, I set up a Facebook account um, to explore what I could about this, and uh, it didn't go too well. It's I come to the conclusion that Facebook is not aimed at old people like me. So, um, one of the younger members has uh, talked to us about setting up a Facebook account for us and dealing with that end of things. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so that would be really good to get uh, presence there. Okay, thank you again for joining us. Now back to Nikki and Callum in the studio. Thanks for that, Megan. Now, as promised, we bring you the last instalment of a debate on vandalism. Can we class it as art in the real world, or is it just a nuisance on the landscape? Nina Goodall took a deeper look into the world of graffiti and spoke to an artist named Bud about the limitation on artists' creative freedom. Bud is just an example of the sector of society wanting to express themselves on Canterbury walls. He has requested to keep his identity hidden in order to ensure no possible consequences are taken against his artwork. He says his art contains a message people just don't want to hear. People don't want to think about governments being corrupt and, and the police and so on. So it's just a case of, you know, people are ignorant. In the past decade we have seen an increase in the street art being showcased in galleries all around the world. I think it's good. Um, obviously, anything, anything or you can get paid to do so that you enjoy it is fantastic. However, when graffiti makes its way into art exhibitions, many feel there are double standards when it comes to regulations. People, people see you know something on a wall in in, in a gallery, and it, it's art. But people see it on a street, you know, and they see spray paint. It's just instantly the worst thing in the entire world. Bud feels that current laws against street art are too strict. He explains how he feels these guidelines are outdated in our current society. And at the end of the day, we're just doing something that you know we want to be involved with, something that we feel is expressing us. And 
you know, I think the fact that people are, are in situations where they can get charged and arrest, like, arrested for just you know, putting their opinions out, it's, it's not very modern, is it? Are legal graffiti walls the answer? Many people feel providing such areas will resolve the problems many graffiti artists face. We can put our stuff up and, and then we have this channel to do it. And I think it, overall that's, that's going to work out a lot better. People aren't going to be getting in trouble for it. There's going, to, there's going to be a place for people to express themselves. With the rise of artists such as Banksy in the last 10 years, it's no wonder people are taking to the streets to express themselves in forms of art such as this one. It's a controversial debate among many people whether graffiti is art or whether it's mindless vandalism. We asked the public whether they thought graffiti was a form of art. 73.5% said it was and only 36% believed police should be more harsh. Thanks Nina. But now, make sure you have your say on this topic. Is graffiti art or vandalism? Tweet us at underscore hot culture and tell us what you think. Now, we meet Jackie Marshall, an illustrator and artist who has a keen interest in the history of graffiti. She joins us in the studio today to share her views with Nina Goodall. Hi, I'm joined by Jackie. Uh, obviously, we've talked a bit about graffiti in today's society. Yeah. Uh, could you give me a, a description of the history of graffiti? Uh, well, I don't know too much about the history of uh, graffiti, but my encounter with the history of graffiti has been at um, the cathedral, mm -hmm. where um, you find um, graffiti scratched into columns and uh, various bits of stonework and so forth, um, usually consisting of dates and initials, that kind of very old-fashioned graffiti, so mm -hmm. that's uh, really my encounter with mm -hmm. it from that point of view. Uh, and what do you think the difference is between graffiti that's on the street and graffiti that's made its way into galleries? Um, well, somebody's appropriated the gallery kind of uh, graffiti as a commodity, haven't they? A money-making commodity, and maybe they appreciate it from an aesthetic point of view. Mm. I suppose what's on the street, um, there's an anarchic element to it, there's a sometimes um, a destructive element to it, um, maybe some people perceive it as threatening. Mm. Um, it's a matter of context, maybe. Mm. And how do you feel about the regulations uh, on graffiti in Canterbury? Do you think they need to be changed at all? Well, I guess um, I don't know about the regulations on graffiti in Canterbury per se, but I um, presume that they are, you know, to do with uh, defacing property and so on and so forth. I have read that um, some um, authorities provide open walls um, where people can spray away to their heart's content. And I suppose going back to your history question, graffiti used to be maybe scratched into a column, mm -hmm. and now because of paint technology and... Um, you can, you know, cover a vast expanse of wall in no time. Yeah. So um, there's a big difference in um, what you actually see out there today. Yeah. That's what you used to see. So. Thank you very much for joining us today. Okay. It's interesting to get your perspective on that side of the day. Thanks very much. Uh, back to you in the studio. Thank you, Nina. Now, we take a look at what you've been saying on Twitter. Frandis Nina says, it's art, it brightens up a city. And Kay Kaylee James says, if it's done properly in an appropriate place, then it can be art. But if it's kids just messing around, that's when it becomes vandalism. And Josh Munton One says, I think it's always art. Even if it's ugly, it's someone's way of expressing themselves. Thank you. And that's all we've got time for. I'm Callum Erskine. And I'm Nikki Scott. Thanks from the Hot Culture team and goodbye. goodbye.